appear that there's any kind of a, an effort up there yet. Now remember, oh my God. Oh my God. That looks like a second plane. Has just I hit. Breaking news. All your favorite drunken peasants. I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> but what's, what the fuck is going on? Hmm. All right. Little difficulties. What's to be pulling? For, what, where is it getting this? I think our fucking program is uh, frozen or something. There it does it. <laughs> Fuck is going on, man? This is the fucking perils of doing a live show right here. <clears throat> oh, deep fat fried. Boom. Bear with me, folks. Start again. Here that there's any kind of a, an effort up there yet. Now remember, oh my God. Oh my God. That looks like a second plane. Just I just Breaking news! All your favorite drunken peasants' shirts are back on sale! It's the last chance sale. Save 25% on sh all the shirts you remember, like prying open Paul's third eye, and the Dino shirt, and the Coolsville shirt, and the band people shirts, and one if by land, two if by sea, three is for the manatee, and who could forget the classic Smoke pan every day, official drunken peasants shirts, and many, 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 many more. Oh my god, there are so many shirts and hoodies and things for, for you to buy and stuff. Do it! Follow the directions in the description section of this video to save 25% on these fabulous shirts. Do it! Do it, you fucking pieces of shit! Tonight on Deep Fat Fried, we take a look at this magnificent bastard. The fucking one thing standing between us and the conquest of Xenu! Tonight, L. Ron Hubbard is Deep Fat Dun 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 dun. Wow, Scotty, those technical issues that you caused earlier were fucking pretty bad. Another dude. smooth opening, TJ. I yep. mean, really, just gliding into that fucking opening. Kicked a field goal. Just yeah. perfect. You know man. what, TJ? It's good. Right down the middle. It's you all good. good. Ah, pathetic, TJ. You're pathetic. Uh, if Elron Hubbard was running this show, <laughs> it would have been smooth, dude. We'd, like have, we'd, have, we'd have one like million live like viewers butter. if Elron Hubbard was running the show. Well, he was a genius. I mean, I, you can't put me on the level. Boy, of genius. Hubbard. You can't expect me to function on that Elron Hubbard dude, level of greatness. He was just amazing throughout every moment of his life, from the time he was a zygote to this fucking when he shed his mortal coil. Does, An amazing human being. Does Scotty have a mullet? That's a question from the chat, Scotty. Do you have a mullet? It doesn't look mulletish to me. It's about the same length all the way around. Yeah, it's about the same. Whatever, mullet face. Whatever, ah. you fucking mullet-having piece of shit. I mean, it's bordering on business in the front, party in the back, uh, but it has to be uh, a little shorter all around. Uh, yeah, front, Paul. You know. What? That's great, Paul. You belching. Uh, that's awesome, Paul. You the belching reader. Wow, that's great, Paul. The fascinating stuff, Paul. The faces of Paul. Have you seen that, Paul? That there's like a there's a thing. Yeah. Where it's like Paul is bored. It's like, dude, Paul is like the Eeyore of our group. He's just that's on top of that. Like, dude, what am I supposed to do? Like, have my face like this the entire show? <laughs> the Paul like, show. You're never gonna find a neutral moment during the show. You know what I mean? Like, fuck that, dude. Why don't you look perpetually excited Paul? to be part of okay, this endeavor? Okay, nobody's Paul. gonna get another one from me today. <laughs> 
I'm no, happy. Ron Hubbard. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna be mirthful, Paul. Today, let's uh, let me show. Beautiful. Yeah, try and pull a bored screenshot of my face today, bitches. <laughs> let's take a look here. Let's Paul take, is happy today. Let's take a look at what people are talking about here. I think it's this one here. Fuck the people. Fuck what they're talking. Oh, fuck. So oh, well, bored. God, Paul, you're bored, dude. Yeah, look at that, dude. Man, <laughs> I better liven things up. <laughs> Holy shit, man. You better not have a single a single neutral faced moment yeah. in the in the entire podcast. <laughs> nope. What's wrong with you, Paul? I don't know, man, but you're not, you're not excited whatever to be whatever here. it was is fixed now. <laughs> we need to liven this show up. I think we should uh, <laughs> let's, let's be lively. I'm so happy. To, Paul, I think I need to take my shirt off and spank you cuz I <laughs> What? <laughs> That's what gets the big No, dude, now. no, you're not getting your rocks off. Hold on, it, Paul. Like, no, you're not doing it. You're not doing it. D oh god, oh, dude. Oh god, TJ, please. Aren't we going to get uh, banned for showing oh, your fucking god, moves, no, dude? No, no. Holy shit. Oh. Uh, Those things are pendulous. Uh, uh, Have they gotten bigger since the last time I've seen them? Maybe so. Are they bigger than the last time you remember looking oh, at them, Scotty? Oh my god, yeah. dude. I don't even want to remember the last time I saw these man tits. Open your eyes, Scotty. Holy Face shit. your nightmares. Oh god, no. Those are some fucking delicious God, you're a melons. fucking pasty fuck, TJ. <laughs> oh I thought I was fucking pasty, but god wow. damn, dude. Oh, holy shit. So you're not fuck. ready for your spanking then, Paul? <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh. That's what successful shows do. <laughs> They, they that spank. separates us from the top tier oh, shows. God, oh yeah, dude. Oh, the spankings. Fuck. I'll pass. Oh. I'll pass. I'll, I'll remain shit tier if you don't mind. All right, all right. Fair enough. Good fair because enough. you are <laughs> <laughs> checkmate. Someone in the chat says I'm afraid yet aroused. So cool. <laughs> well, then, I'm yeah. afraid, but yet aroused at the same time. I'm afraid time. yet I'm aroused, and then I'm afraid that I'm aroused. Why am I so aroused by this, guys? For those of you who are just listening to this, I took off my shirt and displayed my pendulous uh, man tits. Does that mean you're rippling muscles? God, they're more than a handful. Yeah. More than more than a handful. I mean, TJ, like they were spilling out of your hands. Don't you know, like the power of like the spoken word? You should be like TJ uh, revealed his rippling six pack and bulging pecs. <laughs> yeah. Dude, that fucking can just took one of my fucking whiskers out. <laughs> <laughs> what a prick! Yeah, I get wrecked, dude. What a prick! What a fucking prick! So, Scott, you wanted to uh, you wanted us to waste our audience's time shilling Patreon, I guess. So go ahead. Yeah, uh, Patreon is good. Patreon is life. You know, uh, this podcast, the only reason we're able to do it is shit like Patreon because we don't really do advertising. I guess that's not true because TJ put that ad in front of the video. But we don't do, we don't do much advertising, so we do Patreon. Five bucks a month, uh, and you get the other episode starting March 1st. But that's really, that's our monetization model. That was a terrible explanation. Listen. There's two shows a week. Right now, we're giving you both of them. That was a fucking great explanation. Shut dude. up, Scotty. You had your chance. You had it your fucking good. chance, and you, you have failed. The fucking, you have two shows. Yeah, there's fucking... we do two shows a week. Two shows. Monday, Friday. Monday, Friday. That's yeah, what we do. That's right. But soon, Friday will only be for people who are patrons. And all you people who aren't willing to chill out to five bucks to get the Friday shows every month. You'll probably just steal it anyways. Yeah, you don't... You, yeah, you just got to steal them, let's be honest. But... Ostensibly, you can't get them. <laughs> <laughs> there are. I mean, you and probably patrons. you probably easily will if you <laughs> want to. And there's nothing we can really do to stop you. But you can't do it. <laughs> All right. So basically, it boils down to if you want to support us, become a patron. Yeah. We know some people are going to steal it. And honestly, those people, we don't give a shit because we know it's going to happen anyways. We're not going to waste our time trying to stop that. Oh shit, man! I think my face might have gone but, neutral during that chilling. Oh shit, dude! Shit! You neutral faced piece of shit. You definitely deserve that spanking, Paul. You need that spanking, no. buddy. But I don't know uh, what you're talking about, TJ? TJ just throwing shade. Uh, so sign up if you want. If not. We understand. You're just a fucking soulless piece of shit. <laughs> Good one, Scotty! <laughs> <laughs> the look on TJ's face is just disturbing. <laughs> because if, you, if anyone actually knows TJ, if you're hanging out with TJ, this is his expression most times. He's on a phone, just kind of like... Eh. Yeah, with... <laughs> coming out of it. <laughs> or he's looking at porn. TJ just looks at porn, like, nonstop. I need two phones. I need a... A porn phone and a Tetris phone. I got two phones, one for the Tetris and one for the porn. <laughs> Damn, that's some nice tit. Oh shit, I fucking. <laughs> ah, no, L fucking LPs, piece of shit!
Oh, nice T-spin, TJ. Nice T-spin. That was a beautiful T-spin right there, TJ. Boom! Tetris for TJ. Boom! Tetris for TJ. Well, what's the guy that always wins? Jonas, dude. Tetris for Jonas? Boom, Tetris for Jonas. Oh, and boom, another Tetris yeah, they, for they Jonas. Always, they always throw that boom, but it's like a very controlled boom. Tetris boom. for Jonas. Tetris Good old Jonas. Jonas. Dude, Jonas is dude, fucking I good. Dude, I love watching Jonas, dude. If, if anyone here in this chat has not watched Jonas, I forget his last name, it's like Newbauer or some shit. If you haven't watched that fucker play Tetris, you're missing out. Yeah. And if you haven't watched Tetris before, I could recommend something. If you don't have an internet connection, if you want to paint a wall and watch that paint dry on the wall. Dude, tet that, those fucking Tetris matches are pretty fucking riveting and intense. Come dude. on, TJ. Come you on, shut your TJ. damn mouth. Come you on, You shut TJ. your damn mouth, Paul. I know Pulse Pounding Entertainment, and that ain't it, TJ. It is. It is, Paul. You just hey, Paul, where was Tetris invented, dude? Russia. Russia. Yeah. Oh, hey, TJ. Russia connection. Nazdrovia, you're a comrade. Fucking, TJ, you're a Russian troll bot, dude. Trump once played Tetris, a game made in Russia. Yep. The pieces are falling into place, literally. Enough okay, bullshit. okay. Shut up! Enough bullshit. Shut TJ. up! Hey, dude, bring it down, TJ. Are you running Jesus the fucking Christ. show, TJ? We're not even here, TJ. Are you confused why you're here? All right, all right. I, I, I know how well you're going to start this motherfucker. No, 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 no. I don't know how we're going to work here. Listen now, boy. Shut up. Listen now, boy. All right, go ahead. Listen now. This is how we're going to do we're this. We're waiting. Guy. This is Ryan right Howard right now. This is Ron Hubbard, y'all. Yep, that's him. In his mortal form. So this, uh, you guys might notice that he's connecting some electrode bullshit yep. to a tomato. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And staring at the fucking tomato. Yeah, he, um... um he so, was... Paul, you, uh, you know the explanation for this, uh, picture. Yeah, I know the basics. Uh, he was doing some research into whether or not vegetables had the same basic properties of conscious life. So, like... <laughs> He's he, um he has this idea that there's this energy behind everything and it's called theta, and so he was testing to see if uh, tomatoes would respond to questions like a human would, and he could get the same kind of readings on the e meter that he uses to test humans. So yeah, and he kind of concluded that uh, tomatoes could indeed understand what you were saying to them and had a uh, an emotional theta life. Okay, so, so yeah. Um. That is what we call it's part <laughs> quackery of the, it's, and pseudoscience. It's part of the really important scientific research of L. Ron Hubbard, of which there was, you know, there was tons. I mean, the man really pushed quackery and pseudoscience to a new fucking level. I mean, if you have to give him anything, you just have to, like, you know, to fucking kind of fucking steal from George Collins, you just have to stand back in awe from his bullshit. Because, I mean, like, this guy's life was just, he, he was just a bullshit artist from day one. Everything about him is pretty much suspect that you can read about. I mean, like most of you can. There's parts you can verify that are false, and there's parts you can you can see are true. But overall, I mean, this guy has just built a total mythology has been built around this person. Yeah, I mean, and he he built it around himself because he created that environment in Scientology where he was unquestionable. Questioning him is one of the ultimate sins in Scientology. Still to this day. Oh yeah. They will uh, sit Scientologists down for what they call security checks and ask them if they've been having uh, evil thoughts about L. Ron Hubbard or David Miscavige, the current leader of the church. So that's the ultimate sin in Scientology was to think badly of him. So he could tell them whatever he wanted, and he did. Um, according to Hubbard, he was a world explorer who had mastered hundreds of dead languages and traveled all over the world studying humanity and um, a soldier and a, a, a pilot and a captain of many different vessels. And uh, most of that's totally untrue. All right, so let's take a little look here at the Wikipedia page for uh, good old Elron here. Um, Lafayette Ronald, or Elron Hubbard, uh, often referred to by his initials LRH, was an American author and the founder of the Church of Scientology. After establishing a career as a writer, becoming best known for his science fiction and fantasy stories, he developed a system called Dianetics, which was first expounded in book form in May of 1950. He subsequently developed his ideas into a wide-ranging set of doctrines and practices as part of a new religious movement that he called Scientology. His writings became the guiding text for the Church of Scientology and a number of affiliated organizations that address such diverse topics as business administration, literacy, and drug rehabilitation. 
The church's dissemination of these materials led to Hubbard being listed by the Guinness Book of World Records as the most translated and published author in the world. Hubbard also holds the Guinness World Record for the most audiobooks published for one author. In 2014, Hubbard was cited by Smithsonian Magazine as one of the 100 most significant Americans of all time as one of the 11 religious figures on that list. So there are some accomplishments there that are um, pretty impressive. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, just the establishment of a religion is something that, what, how many people in history can claim to have done and, that? Yeah, and how many have tried. Right? Um, so that alone kind of makes him a standout American figure. Um, but a lot of those accomplishments are, you know, very, very dubious. His involvement with drug rehabilitation is a huge scandal right now. Um, a, a, subsidy, a subsidiary of the church called Narconon is being shut down all over the place, all over the country, uh, because it's just, it's quackery. I mean, what they do is they pump you full of like huge high doses of vitamins and have you work out and sit in a sauna all day. And that's supposed to get you off of drugs and purify your body of drugs. And really what it does is it sometimes drives people crazy, breaks people down physically and mentally. Um, and so these, these fucking centers are being closed left and right all over the country well, for in, abuses. In, in, like, Germany, I've read it a number of times how, like, Scientology has actually been, like, officially deemed to just be a cult. I mean, which, oh, yeah. it, which it really is. I mean, like, you know, and obviously, like, you know, most religions you can make kind of make the argument that, that people have these kind of cultish behaviors and they have, you know, they, they basically become subservient to, you know, a, a dogma or an ideology, really just putting their own critical thinking skills aside. And it's just kind of interesting because like the, the the mainstream public's biggest, I think, uh, dose of this, so to speak, was with Tom Cruise, you know, going and doing that interview where he's all like, no, Brooke Shields doesn't need to take uh, any of that shit. That's bad for her. She doesn't take antidepressants. They're bad. Yeah. You know, they, 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 you, know they, you just need to do exercise and use chemicals. You don't know the history of psychiatry. I do. Yeah, that famous glib. moment. Yeah. You're being glib, Matt. You're being glib. You don't understand this. You're so fucking glib. But, uh, you know, to be honest with you, the shit that I've seen from Scientology, that moment of, Sci of, of Tom Cruise, that little breakdown moment, is one of the least weird things that happens. <laughs> oh, I know. All right, uh, let's get a little bit more into uh, his early life. Um, this is uh, kind of... Uh, this kind of gets into the, the beginnings of his tall tale telling. And yes, I know. Wikipedia the show. Wikipedia the show. Wikipedia the show. Great, great, great. This is the Wikipedia hour. Yeah, we are going to read from the Wikipedia. We have a lot of other stuff, too. Don't worry. Uh, but th this is an interesting... I read these paragraphs earlier, and I thought this was uh, kind of a fascinating thing. Biographical accounts published by the Church of Scientology describe Hubbard as a child prodigy of sorts <laughs> who rode a horse before he could walk. Wow. That's a hell of an <laughs> What a fucking hero. <laughs> and was able to read and write by the age of four. A Scientology profile says he was brought up on his grandfather's large cattle ranch in Montana where he spent his days riding, breaking broncos, hunting coyote, and taking his first steps as an explorer. Was, was he John Wayne by the time he was five? Yes. <laughs> yes. His grandfather is described as a wealthy Western cattleman uh, with whom Hubbard inherited his fortune and family interest in America and South Africa, etc. Scientology claims that Hubbard became a blood brother of the Native American Blackfoot tribe at the age of six through his friendship with a Blackfeet medicine man. All yep. right, now that was that was the Scientology version. Here's the real version. However, contemporary records show that his grandfather, Lafayette Waterbury, was a veterinarian, not a rancher, and was not wealthy. <laughs> Hubbard was actually raised in a townhouse in the center of Helena. According to his aunt, his family did not own a ranch, but did own one cow and four or five horses well, on there a few you acres of land outside the city. Hubbard lived over 100 miles from the Blackfeet Reservation. While some sources support Scientology's claim of Hubbard's blood brotherhood, other sources say that tribe did not practice blood brotherhood and no evidence has been found that he had ever been a Blackfeet blood brother. Well, they're just full of shit, man. <laughs> I mean, come on. You know he jumped on a horse at six years old and rode to the fucking Blackfoot Reservation to commune with a medicine man. This, yeah, I mean, is, this man, he could ride a horse he, before he could He literally walk, lived man, in one of the so. most populous cities in his bumfuck goddamn state of Montana in a townhouse. 
Yeah. He, you know, probably on the weekend to go like, we have a cow and we got some horses. This is fun. But every aspect of his life has that similar kind of bent to it. If you listen to Scientology, like he never had a dull moment. You know what I mean? Oh, no. Hubbard was always exploring and making new inroads in science. He, he claims to be a nuclear physicist. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's not. It's just like... It's just like hanging around someone that tells tall tales, but instead of everyone just going, well, that's bullshit, it's a bunch of people going, yeah, I see that. Yeah, he did that. Well, yeah, they have to. But I mean, but I, I guess the question, the crux of it is why would you, why would you believe it? All right. So since we're on the t subject of his lies here, um, I actually do have an article that uh, details several, uh, actually 25 of his lies. Um, one of which we've already gone over, but it's kind of funny just the lies he told and the tall tales. Um, and this is by no means a comprehensive list. No. no. <laughs> this is just scratching the fucking surface. So this here, he says, uh, the lie is, I happen to be a nuclear physicist. I am not a <laughs> psychologist, nor a psychiatrist, nor a medical doctor. L. Ron Hubbard, in a 1952 lecture, Dianetics, the Modern Miracle. Also found transcribed in Research and Discovery Series, Volume 3, page 470. And New Tech Volumes, Volume 5, page 143. The truth, Hubbard flunked both high school and college, leaving after his sophomore year at George Washington University, during which he <laughs> failed a course of molecular and atomic physics. Isn't it just great? So he, so he calls himself a nuclear physicist, and the truth is, is that he just failed a, an introductory course on atomic physics. Well, yes. You know why I always claimed not to you know, be a psychiatrist or doctor was because he didn't want to be accused of, of practicing medicine without a license. That's why he always said stuff like, oh, well, I'm not actually, because you know, he was a good con artist. He knew he, couldn't, he didn't want to be ever accused of that, so he said, oh, I'm not that, but I'm this. Because, I mean, even though it's clear he wasn't a nuclear physicist, it's easier to say, oh, well, this is why I, I, you know, I studied this. I understand this. Because, one, in, in popular culture at the time, that was a big deal. That was, that, that was in the cultural zeitgeist. Well, people, it, who's going to question you at that time? There's no internet. Yeah. You know what I mean? So he could say whatever he wanted, and then they'd be like, oh, man, he knows about nuclear physics. Shit. All right. So uh, we the, the blood brother uh, claim that he was a blood brother of the Blackfoot Nation. Uh, that was total bullshit. We already just established that. Yeah. Um, Hubbard claimed he slept with bandits in Mongolia and traveled in India and Tibet. Evidence shows he was never in any of those countries. <laughs> uh, Hubbard said he was a pioneering barnstormer at the dawn of aviation in America. Oh, my God. Got it. Okay. As John Attic points out, Hubbard flew, Hubbard flew gliders in the early 1930s, which doesn't really put Hubbard <laughs> there with the Wright brothers or Charles Lindbergh. Um, Hubbard's 1940 adventures in Alaska led to the development of Loran, a radio-based system for navigation. Um, Total bullshit. Alfred Lee Loomis invented Loran, long-range aid to navigation. In the 1920s and 1930s, a oh, tuxedo shit. park in the U.S., Hubbard was not even remotely qualified to do any serious electrical engineering. Well, so there's another lie. This is a this is this is one of the tallest of his tales right here. All right, L. Ron Hubbard claimed to have created the U.S. Air Force. <laughs> God, you you gotta love you gotta love the bullshit that came out of this guy. He claimed to, he claimed to invent the U.S. Air Force. Yep. <laughs> Uh, basically, here's, here's, here's his justification for that. In 1941, Hubbard was one of many people offering free advice to government officials about how the U.S. should prepare for a war uh, the country seemed sure to get involved in. On June 30th, Senator Pat McCarran of Nevada wrote a letter to Hubbard telling, them he, that, telling him that he would indeed push for a bill to create a U.S. Air Force. But 10 days earlier, the U.S. Army... Corps had already changed its name to the U.S. Army Air Force. The U.S. Air Force, under the name we know today, came into existence later in 1947. So basically, Hubbard wrote a letter and said, hey, we need an Air Force 10 days after we'd already started one. Yeah, received and a yeah. courtesy letter well, in yeah. reply was, saying, yeah, I'll look into it. He was a proponent of the Air Force. I'll give him that. Yeah, obviously he saw the need for it, sure. Just not the creator. Right. Well, yeah, that's a far different thing. And wasn't certainly wasn't the dude that originated the idea, wasn't the only person that had the idea and had nothing to do okay, with the implementation you know what, of the idea. You know what the idea. equivalent would be? That'd be like saying, like, you know what, I actually invented Bitcoin because just because I, I, I buy Bitcoin, I'm a supporter of it, you know, hey, guys, I actually invented Bitcoin. You might not know that, but it was me. Uh, I did I it. actually invented Bitcoin. Oh, it was actually you. 
you that invented yeah. Bitcoin? That must have been rough because uh, I was the one that invented Bitcoin. So I don't oh, know. What you oh, have. shit. Looks dude. like we got a legal matter in our <laughs> hands here. Show's done. Uh, Hubbard claimed to have been awarded 21 or 27 combat medals in World War II as a Navy lieutenant. Mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> He's like one of the most. Wouldn't that make him the most one of the most decorated? Not, not the most decorated sure soldier would. in U.S. history. Uh, he was never. At, he at, the truth was he never served a single day in combat. Yep. And he was never awarded any combat medals. He oh, was awarded. What a shock. He was awarded four medals for like, you know, like basically participation. <laughs> yeah. He got, a medal. he got a fucking participation ribbon. Yeah, um, there's more about that I read over here in his Wikipedia Yeah, he claimed article. he had purple hearts because he was oh, wounded God. in action a bunch of times. Yeah, according to the Los Angeles Times, Hubbard's official Navy service record indicates that his military performance was, at times, substandard. <laughs> he received only four <laughs> campaign medals rather than 21. He was never recorded as being injured or wounded in combat. Oh, which, he, which is another thing he claimed. We'll get to that in a minute. Most of his military service was spent ashore in a continental United St in the continental United States on administrative or training duties. <laughs> he served for a short time in Australia, but was sent home after quarreling with his superiors. <laughs> Sounds like a great soldier. He's an asshole. He briefly commanded two anti-submarine vessels, the USS YP-422 and the USS PC-815 in coastal waters off Massachusetts, Oregon, and California in 1942 and 1943 respectively okay yeah so that's what he did his little i i did all this impressive stuff <laughs> i did i done it all oh man he told some whoppers about all right, he, this is another yeah. one hubbard was wounded in combat and was awarded two purple hearts and a bronze star Total bullshit. Yep. Just no fucking way happen. dude he claimed that he was the first casualty of the war in the south pacific in World War II. Which, yes. I don't know if that's like, is that bragging rights? I don't know. Apparently he I thought was it was. dude to get shot. Total bullshit once again. He was never even in combat. Uh, Hubbard was a c commander of corvettes in the North Atlantic. Uh, the reality was Hubbard was assigned command of a Navy Yard patrol vessel in Boston Harbor. However, <laughs> he was relieved of command before the vessel was commissioned after getting into an argument with the commandant of the, the Navy Yard. Wow. So he argued with the with the commandant in a navy. He he. So this he, guy this guy's a fucking idiot, dude. He claimed that he fought German U-boats. He didn't. He claimed he was machine gunned in the back by a Japanese I mean, soldier. Just hearing all oh, this. Dude. So he was in the South Pacific. So he, he was fucking fighting the Japanese, but then he was also in the Atlantic fighting the Germans. Yes, yes. he was all over. What what the fuck was this guy, dude? He claimed that he was he escaped from Java uh, with a fellow spy in a rubber raft and drifted two thousand miles back to Australia. <laughs> In a rubber raft? Yes. Okay. Uh, what? He claimed that he sunk a Japanese oh, submarine oh. after a battle that lasted 35 hours. Uh. It said, it, this is great. The actual story is that he actually launched depth charges at a magnetic deposit on the ocean floor off the coast of Oregon. Yeah, so he thought he found a submarine, dude, launched it, all the ordnance on the this, ship. This is like Don Quixote fighting the fucking windmill, dude. Yeah. I mean, come on. Um... At the end of the war, Hubbard said he had an almost non-existent future because he'd been crippled and blinded, uh, which obviously he was just fine after the war. He didn't even participate. Yeah, he had. No. Uh, I think his military uh, records show that he had mild conjunctivitis. He uh, described <laughs> the occultist Aleister Crowley as his good friend. He actually never met Aleister Crowley. Uh, Crowley did write about him once in a letter saying, apparently Parsons or Hubbard or somebody is producing a moon child. I don't know what a fucking moon child is. I get fairly frantic when I contemplate the idi idiocy of these louts. So after he got out of the military, uh, Hubbard moved in with his friend Jack Parsons in Pasadena, California, into uh, like a house that he had there and started doing these kind of uh, Aleister Crowley inspired sex magic rituals. Um, the result of which was supposed to be the birth of the Antichrist or a moon child. Okay. And uh, there was a, an actress that was involved in those sex rituals and the girlfriend of Jack Parsons, Sarah Northrup, who uh, Hubbard eventually stole from Jack Parsons and married. Hmm. And then went to his grave denying that he was ever married to, by the way. If you would asked anybody in Scientology how many wives uh, L. Ron Hubbard has, they will say two. And the actual answer is three. 
Uh, Hubbard's 1950 book Dianetics claims from the start that it was a milestone for man comparable to his discovery of fire <laughs> and superior to his invention of the wheel and the arch. Okay. They still use that. Uh, obviously, that's just, I mean, that's just, that's a matter of opinion, Ron, I guess. L. Ron but... Hubbard was fucking Prometheus, dude. Oh, I've read Dianetics. It's been a long time, but uh, I, I didn't feel like I was discovering the fucking wheel. Well, he says that Dianetics, <laughs> this is, this Fire, is, Paul. This is some of the things he says Dianetics can do. It can cure arthritis. Uh-huh. It can cure myopia. Cool. Uh, heart illness decreases, asthma disappears, stomach functions properly, and a whole catalog of illnesses go away and stay away. So basically, it's just going to heal all your medical ailments. Well, do you know why that is? Why? Okay, so part of what Scientology does, all illness or uh, misfortune that you go through is due to um, some incident in your past. So he, he gives an example of this in a talk that I've heard where he says there's this little kid doesn't want to get up and go to school. So he fakes he has a stomach ache. Right. And he does this enough times and he starts to believe that he has a stomach ache. And then you fast forward 20 or 30 years in the dude's life and he's got stomach ulcers. Well, where did he get them? Well, it's because he posited these stomach ulcers all the way back in his childhood and he did it so much that he made it real. So in his adulthood, he's got these ulcers because when he was a kid, he used to pretend he was sick all the time. So if you find that out, boom, ulcers gone. You know, you know what's beautiful is they've actually proved ulcers was caused by a certain type of bacteria. So uh, <clears throat> his theory is b -b 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 bullshit. Uh, Dianetics promised the state of clear, which would include complete recall of everything that has happened to him or anything he's ever studied. Uh, when Hubbard introduced his first clear in August 1950, she was unable to remember what she had eaten on certain days or even the color of the tie Hubbard was wearing. What? Okay. Yeah. So that's the, that's the first step in Scientology is you, you attain the state of clear, which means that your whole emotional reactive mind has been blanked out and you can access any memory. Any memory of any conversation, you have perfect recall amongst other things. You're completely immune to illness, sickness, or disease. He so, should have made it something easier to just fake, because you know, obviously, you can do. Tests well, that's on the that's memory. the brilliance of Scientology, because if if something happens in your life, that means you fucked up. You 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 you're called a potential trouble source. You're PTS. So if you if if you get sick. It's not because Scientology doesn't work. It's because you've been fucking up somewhere and you need to go back to get some more training. Uh, he claimed he earned a PhD from Sequoia University. Apparently, Sequoia was a no notorious diploma mill. Oh, shit. Scam situation. I, my dad, I don't think my dad owned that one. It was too early. <coughs> too early uh, on. Which awarded bogus degrees based on no coursework or exams. Uh, he claimed he never had a second wife. Uh, he said, it says, while married to his third wife, Mary Sue Whip, Hubbard made this bizarre claim in 1968 to Grenada Television about Sarah Northrup, uh, who he badly wanted to erase from his life. Okay. Yep. Whatever. That's what Paul just talked about. Yeah, Paul already uh, discussed that. Um... I don't know. So, that, that those are pretty much the big lies. Yeah, I mean... There were quite a few more. Um, one of the things that's not mentioned in there is that Hubbard was discharged uh, of his command of a Navy vessel, uh, finally, for accidentally shelling a populated uh, island off the coast of Mexico during a routine training exercise. He launched live am ammunition at a population center. So he was relieved of duty. His discharge papers reflect that. Um, yeah, he was a total fuck up. But he has created this mythology around him like he was some world-traveling fucking soldier that fought in every major battle. It, it, <laughs> it, it's so reminiscent of, like, the North Korean dynasty of, like, you know, they don't shit. You know, Kim Jong-il fucking, you know, go, uh, golf was, like, 18 holes in one, you know. <laughs> you guys want to see some videos Just about shit him? like that. Oh, yeah, let's see some videos yeah. about this guy. All right, so uh, we, we, we don't have a whole lot of videos, but we do have a few. I'm going to go ahead and take a look at uh, this one's called uh, L. Ron Hubbard and the Eskimos. Oh, interesting. Hey, don't you hate Eskimos, TJ? I Bubble. do. In the Arctic one time, I was on an expedition. <laughs> one, no. of the, one of the natives that was loading some barges kept just sitting off to the side, not helping his fellow natives. You know, just sitting off to the side and doing nothing. 
What a piece of shit. And pretty soon, why I heard I one of Mexican them calling dudes on, that they're on, Asian dudes that got to play Eskimos. Nobody can learn this. What? Like, it, Scientology puts all these things together, and you know there's not a single Eskimo on this set. There's a bunch of Mexican dudes and Asian dudes with furs. That guy looks kind of Eskimo. Maybe. This Eskimo tongue, it's a very rough tongue. And he called him a Well, I'd heard myself. A he called him a rah I'll call a rah rah too, so I was very, very curious, you see. I was curious to see what was Of course, the white man always has a very lordly idea of how he's regarded by the lesser races. You know? He's after you know? all the commanding race, and so on. But they were calling me oh, a rah and dude, calling him a rah too didn't sit well. So I put the foreman of this crew in a brace, and I said, What does that mean? Oh, he said he's lazy, he's no good. And I said, well, what is your word for being lazy and no good? And he says, white man. So in the course of one's research... Fuck this music, I agree. Oh, dude, they're, that's the Scientology hallmark, dude. They have this weird, like, space jazz-esque kind of sound to the music they put behind him. It's weird, man. <laughs> But yeah, he uh, he apparently was uh, an expeditionary officer in the Arctic dealing directly with Eskimos. That probably never happened. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I feel like the music is like a reject from like, 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 you know, like the Star Wars Cantina music. It's like, dun, 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 dun. it's like, it's like they just like, they like fucking took anything that was like rejected from that and just played that as Scientology's fucking uh, soundtrack for this shit. Like S somebody in Scientology thinks it sounds like grand and shit. And no. it just, it sounds like. So it sounds like the soundtrack to a little kid's show about toy trains or some shit. <laughs> One doesn't necessarily have to learn humility. And then Thomas the Tank Engine tries to pull the hill one last time skin. with his load of coal. Is, there a, is that it? Is there a point to that? Nope. He nope. Just, he's, he's just talking about how white men have to have humility when they're dealing with people of the lesser races. The lesser races uh, do not understand. Sometimes the lesser races are a little more savvy than the white so, men. So, Paul, you're a little bit more well-versed in uh, L. Ron Hubbard, uh, Hubbard's life. You, yeah. You've kind of been fascinated by the guy. Yeah. Why don't you tell me a little bit about uh, Xenu? Xenu. So this is like most people know about this that have heard anything about Scientology. Yeah. Mostly because of South Park. Right. So Xenu is um, – so Hubbard – it takes about like 60 or 70 grand to get to the point in Scientology where they'll, where they'll actually tell you the story of, of Xenu. It's OT3. They call it the Wall of Fire. And what you do is you, get, you, you show up at a Scientology org and you're given a locked briefcase to which only you know the combination. And you take that locked briefcase into a room with a Scientology observer and you open it up and inside of it is a photostatic copy of a handwritten letter by Hubbard detailing the story of how the universe came to be. And uh, it, it's basically 75 million years ago, Earth was known as Tegiac. That was the name of Earth, Tegiac. And it was a galactic kind of prison planet, basically. And Xenu was an overlord that was rounding people up um, ostensibly for tax audits. Uh, one of one of Hubbard's boogeyman was always the IRS because you know they were always trying to get him to actually pay because during his life uh, Scientology was never a bona fide religion in the United States, so he was always in tax trouble. So he was an IRS guy. He he rounded up, he made everybody come in to get taxes, but when they came in, he captured them and froze them. And then brought them to Tegiac, which is Earth, and threw them in volcanoes, and then blew up the volcanoes with hydrogen bombs, and their souls came screaming out of the volcanoes, and then he used these big nets to catch all the souls. And I'm not shitting you. This is the story. This is what you're reading when you reach OT3. When you're si if you're already 60 or 70 grand. 70 in grand in the hole, and this is the big secret of your religion. You're finding out the Jesus mythology of your religion, right? So anyway, he captures all the souls. He forces them to sit in movie theaters in front of giant 3D uh, movie screens and watch videos about Jesus and the history of man, all these lies. And then these souls are released to attach themselves to other human beings. So that's why you have problems because you have dead alien souls stuck to you and all of their problems from their life bleed into your life and all Scientology is about is killing those aliens. <laughs> okay. Getting them off of you. So uh, apparently we have a lecture on Xenu here. For this cool. planet 
and for this confederacy of the 21 adjacent stars and its 76 planets. Uh, the incident, too, uh, it is a very long, involved, and complex incident. It's about 36 days. It starts out normally with a capture, some kind or another. Uh, capture. And don't think of yourself as uh, I'm trying to run a capture of having been. Okay, I'm already. <laughs> Listening to Hubbard talk is like listening to someone oh just speak God. gibberish circles. And this I is part lost, of... Dude. I'm it lost is. as fuck. It, Scientologists have an entire way of speaking. It's almost like a subset of the English language. They have all this terminology and shit that they use only within Scientology, and they speak it all the time. And listening to him, it's just like the ravings of a lunatic. Dude. I mean, eventually he gets to some zenith. It's up. not too long. When the walls fell. An airy fairy it's like, God, it. we need a fucking translator. All right, let's hear this. Let's try, I'm going to try to get through this whole speech here. And got you well, down it's not long. And all that <laughs> because people at that particular time and space were walking around in clothes which looked very remarkably like the clothes they wear at this very minute. And the cars they drove million looked years ago. exactly the same. And the trains they ran looked the same. And the boats they had looked the same. All the same. Circa 1950, 1960. Uh... This civilization has simply copied R6 100% because they were told to. And they so that's what I was talking about when I said that the souls were captured and shown all these images. So he claims that our entire modern world is just a copy of uh, a society that lived 75 million years ago at the time of Xenu. Oh. And so they had the same cars and they dressed the same and shit. We're just basically replaying We don't even out. dress the same as they... We don't even have that shit. I mean, like... It, well, I mean, at that time, right? So sure. If they, if they had gotten to... You know, if they had lasted as long as we have, they would have ostensibly developed the same Fucking shit. Fucking Xenu, dude. It's Looks all like the same the story. streets and lived in houses that looked like these houses and so on. That's, that's what the hell. And there was quite a bit of huffle luffle and then upset and so on before our six took place. What it was. There was quite a bit of what? Huffle fluffle. Huffle fluffle. He likes that type of shit. Was, was the loyal officers uh, were the body, the elective body. They called them the loyal officers. They were there to protect the populations and so forth. And they had elected a fellow by the name of Zemu. Uh, could be spelled X-E-M-U, to the Supreme Ruler, and they were about to unelect him, and he took the last moments he had in office to really goof the floof. Yes, I don't blame he him. He goofed for the floof. Something. He really uh, goofed the... Man, if your religion's gonna have a devil... You cannot refer to him as goofing the flute. Yeah, and when and when he's and when he's causing ruckus, you can't call it a huffle fluffle. A huffle fluffle. The devil does not cause a huffle fluffle, and he definitely never goofs the floof. Okay. Yeah, dude. I understand. That, like Zenu is the Scientology Satan, right? Basically. Uh, basically, yeah. Well, he he represents psychiatry. Right. So he was the first psych. Zenu was the first psychiatrist. Okay. And he's actually still alive on the planet. He is uh, inside of a mountain somewhere behind a force field with an eternal battery. So he's still alive somewhere on Earth, imprisoned for his crimes. Oh, I see. Still trying to get out and goof the floof again. Yeah. And, uh... <laughs> yeah, I'd be laughing yeah, too. Yeah, I'd be laughing how absurd this fucking and, story uh... is. He goofed the floof. He really goofed the floof, y'all. <laughs> he really truffled the shuffled. <sighs> Goof. This the is floof. just awful, dude. So yeah, that's Zenu. All right. So uh, how how can you hear this shit? My question is, you know, because I mean, I'm not as, really as well versed in this shit as Paul or, or TJ, but just hearing about. I mean, the, I really don't know shit about L. Ron Hubbard. I'm learning. I'm basically learning yeah, me, as we yeah, go yeah, tonight. me too. And the thing is, I, I just wondered every point, like, how could someone listen to this guy talk and he wasn't eloquent? He, I mean, like, I just don't understand the, like where the persuasiveness came because everything I've read about him is just like, it, it, and listening to him talk, maybe, maybe behind the scenes or something, it, it, I just don't really see it. It's, it's, it. I think it's probably, most people are hooked as a result of the processing that they go through. I see. So it's like it's a, basic confessional shit and, and Scientology, it's the same kind of relief that a person feels, I imagine, when they walk into the confessional booth as a Catholic mm -hmm. and relieve themselves of their sins. Scientology auditing is basically the same thing. You sit across from another Scientologist, they ask you questions about your past, they ask you to recall events from your past that may have 
have upset you, and you run them over and over so, and over again. So it's more the system. <clears throat> that, that, right. And a lot of people feel like kind of a an emotional kind of weight lifted off of them from doing that. And so I think that's how they get their hooks into you. And remember, by the time that you hear about Xenu, by the time that this space opera bullshit happens, you're a good 70 grand and probably three, four, five years into the cult. So it's not like you can just walk away. It's different. Like if they came to you straight out, I'd have a little bit more respect for Scientology because at least they're putting their bullshit out front. And they're like, look, you're, you're aliens all over you and blah, 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 blah. But they, it's a bait and switch thing. I they see. pull you in. It's like a self-help thing, a counseling thing. It's almost a psychological kind of, you know, a Freudian psychotherapy kind of thing. And then once you're in it for a bunch of money and all your friends are Scientologists and everything about your life is Scientology, which is what they enc encourage you to do, then they spring this fucking craziness on you. So basically everything your life become revolves around this and then it's just fed to you and it's like everyone's like this is the truth yeah by the time you get to ot3 when you're hearing about xenu you don't have any friends that aren't scientologists those people have been declared and you've been told to separate from them because they might you know hamper your ability to progress as a scientologist so it's basically the idea has just taken over everything in your life and you and it's just you have to be within this kind of like viral idea of like this is scientology is all you have left exactly this, that's all that matters to you and, and, and even if you had an inkling these other things mattered no. And on people. top of that, think about this. They know that there's a folder. They, every Scientologist has what's called a PC folder, a pre-clear folder. And it has the notes from all their auditing sessions. So all this fucking dark secrets you've talked about, guess who has them? So if you decide, hey, man, this church is bullshit, and you decide you're going to go out and start talking shit about the church, guess whose filthiest secrets are going to get released? You know what I mean? That's how they keep you. So once you're in it... You can't walk away. You know that it's high treason to think bad things about Hubbard. So if you read this Incident 2 bullshit that you get at OT3 and you go, oh, my God, you know, this is bullshit. The fucking alien overlord. This is retarded. <laughs> that thought alone is high treason in Scientology. And if you express that to another Scientologist, they're going to rat on you and you're going to end up set back. You're going to end up having to pay a bunch of money for more auditing and shit to clear why you're having evil thoughts about Hubbard. It makes, it makes a lot more All sense. Right, let's take now. a look at uh, yet another Hubbard video. This one's called L. Ron Hubbard Saves the World. Right. Scientology loves America. At the end of World War II, a chap by the name of Johnny Arwine, Lieutenant Commander of the Coast Guard, and myself, went to the California Institute of Technology, oh, okay. Caltech, Caltech. to meet with a great many old-time atomic physicists who had been at the projects that dropped the original bomb. The people from Los Alamos Gordos. So and he says, he said basically, the, he, he's made a bunch of people for the Manhattan Project, like Oppenheimer yeah, all, and shit all like that. All the top yeah. uh, nuclear physicists in America at the time were gathered around to listen to L. Ron Hubbard, a middling yeah. fired Navy captain that shelled a Mexican island. It, it makes no sense. Yeah. So this never happened. These people. So that some sort of sensible control could be monitored across the bomb. We we're still in uniform. We went down to Caltech. And we got these atomic physicists together. We said we we're going to have a meeting. They remembered us and they were very happy to talk to us. And the next thing you know, we did. We had a very vast number of atomic physicists there. And I took the chair and Arwine addressed them. And we spoke of using a propaganda weapon against anyone who would use atomic fission further against the human race. Wow, dude. I don't know if it's what? just me, but this motherfucker is not only is he full of shit, but he's goddamn boring. He's got this... If you listen to a lot of L. Ron Hubbard, he's got this cadence that you listen to it and your brain just kind of goes... You don't stop listening. You hear everything that he says, but he's got this... His tone, there's something about the way that he speaks that just makes you just kind of shut down and turn into like, I'm receptive mush. <laughs> I'm not, I don't know if I'm that receptive, but I'm mush. Uh, using any means we had to educate uh, the people in the world. Talk faster. This, and the nuclear physicist was already so mad. So mad. He He's was past. already so furious that 
Arwine and I could not control that meeting, even vaguely. We could keep them in their place. We could tell the next fellow to talk, but we we couldn't get across any thought to them that was rationally workable. And these men said only one thing. We wish to overthrow the government of the United States by force. Okay. Uh, a bunch what? Of, a so, bunch of atomic physicists. Yep, they were, were like, look, we've got this overthrow. bomb. Overthrow! We've got this bomb, guys, the most powerful weapon. We're the only ones that know how to fucking make it. We're overthrowing the government, L. Ron Hubbard, and you're not going to convince us otherwise. Never happened. Let's see. I, I, does he convince them otherwise? Now that is an astonishing little chapter in the field of nuclear physics. That's that a only bullshit a chapter in nuclear physics. There was Look a at this big meeting. Look at them. Look at all these motherfuckers who want to take over the fucking United States. In the United States being open to propagandize the public and a movement led by Albert Einstein. And that was the outgrowth of that meeting. So uh, Albert so Einstein took notes from L. Ron Hubbard when he made his anti-nuclear treatise. Yeah. Okie dokie. ...to do with that meeting was say, guys, please, you people are talking in terms of mutiny, revolution. Uh, the so you're in the military, was, and a bunch of, uh, you're, you're, you're basically in a room of the leading theoretical physicists in the U.S. who were saying overthrow the government and, you, and your response is hey guys this sounds a little intense. I just listen to this here we'll develop a bomb, develop a bomb so, so that, that every atomic physicist, every can, physicist have one. can have one <laughs> what every and nuclear nobody physicist can arrest gets him. a bomb now we put this government in place these fellows were mad we withdrew our support and did what we could to knock the rough edges off the movement somehow we did it we said we could not associate our names with this organization. Which is why there's no record of this meeting ever taking place. It all fell to nothing. But the atomic physicist did try. That was his push. It took place late in the year of 1945 in the United uh -huh. States. The punishment taken against him was severe. What was the punishment? He had to listen to me speak. <laughs> Uh, no, that, that's it. That story was fucking. Not only was it gibberish, it was pointless gibberish. I mean, it aggrandizes. It, it once again puts fucking Hubbard's finger into some big, you know, world changing event, though. You know what I mean? After he was done fighting in every major battle in the South Pacific and the Eastern Front. You know, because he was everywhere, man. He commanded every ship that ever sunk a fucking submarine. Then he comes back and the nuclear physicists are all like, look what we did to Japan. We can all have personal nukes and nobody can arrest us because we can just nuke the whole city. And fucking uh, the only man that could talk him down was L. Ron Hubbard, dude. Thank goodness. Yeah, he said, look, I'm going to fucking withdraw my support. And they're like, you know what? The movement has failed. <laughs> can you imagine the fucking horrible uh, fucking nuclear dystopia we'd be living in if L. Ron Hubbard hadn't seen the fucking nuclear physicist revolt happening and stepped in to stop it. Yeah, you know, except that if you look at the personal, like, recollections and writings of most people that developed them, uh, were in the Manhattan Project, they were actually terrified of what they had created. Uh, it wasn't like they were no, all they like... No, they were all like, man, I can't wait to have my yeah, own personal nuke. Yeah, no, you're right. They, they all gathered at Caltech to go, you know what, guys? Every one of them Let like the nukes nuke, fly! A nuclear feudal lord just like, yeah! We'll carve up this country einstein you get the eastern seaboard you know Oppenheimer gets the western seaboard and you know the, the lesser scientists can fucking sort it out uh the middle america shit you know in the south but you know what you one thing you say about ron hubbard he was a hell of a singer hell of a singer oh no hell of a singer. thank you for listening i write just for you listen to this bass but notes. others hearing this may find Things they would argue. Oh. I will say this for him, he's a little bit better than Steven Seagal. Just a, just a hair though. Yeah, just yeah, yeah, much right there. I do not sing what I believe. I only give them fact. If they I do not sing what I believe. I only give them facts. He sings like the, the guy that sings the fucking uh, songs from The Grinch Stole Christmas, dude. Uh, You're a mean one, Elron Hubbard. <laughs> I believe quite a... 
Okay, he's a pretty pale imitation. No, hold on, dude. You gotta hear that bass note again. Still will have him Damn, uh, you hear that shit? Yeah, you yeah. fucking hit it, dude. I can't even hit that yeah. note. So, there's actually quite a bit of this Scientology music around. Um, some pretty famous people have recorded uh, this Road to Freedom album here has a song on it uh, recorded by, uh, what's his name? Fucking Travolta. John Travolta's yeah. little song. There's a Isaac Hayes, obviously, is on there. You know what I mean? Suck on my chocolate, salty mouth. Put them in your mouth. Sweet cover art. Yeah, it's like a bridge to heaven or wherever. Well, that's the bridge to total freedom right there, TJ. Uh, that's uh, Scientology's bridge built on your money. Of where's course. the numerous tolls along yeah, the way? I was gonna that's say, what I want to know. A lot if, you, of toll well, if, you, roads. if you zoomed in, it's just uh, those aren't bricks. Those are bricks of $100 bills. <laughs> You remember when uh, they did the episode on Scientology in South Park, and that, that's when Isaac Hayes finally was like, I just can't be a part of this, and they, they just kill off Chef and everything, and yeah. yeah. And it's funny for us for years, like, they ripped on every other fucking, they ripped on atheism, they ripped on Christianity, you know, Islam, and it's like, nope, the minute you attack my bullshit beliefs, like, I can't, ha I can't handle this shit. I, I mean, and Hayes, like, had no choice. They would have ruined him. Oh, of course. Like, if he would have taken part in that episode or stayed on the show after that, they've, they've committed the cardinal sin. You can't speak out against Scientology. You're a Nazi oh, if no. you do that. Yeah, I mean, like, like you elucidated before, you, you know, it's not even optional. Hubbard is on record saying that anybody that has anything negative to say about Scientology is only doing so to draw attention away from their own crimes. You know, it's kind of crazy because uh, Tom Cruise just apparently left the Church of Scientology like four or five days ago. Really? I didn't even hear about that. Yep. Uh, seeing numerous reports of him leaving the church. That's here. been a long time coming. Um, he's been kind of on the outs with the church for a long time. They've been really trying to like bring him back in. He's their number one draw. He's the superstar of the church. Like he's their number one recruiting tool is Tom Cruise, and they treat him like fucking royalty. Well, apparently not anymore. Well, they fucked with his life though. Like, look, he met uh, Nicole Kidman on the set of Days of Thunder. Right, fell in love with her, uh, had kids with her, had, was married to her, but she was not into the Scientology shit. She joined the church because she had to in order to marry him and shit. But once she started finding out about the craziness, she was like, "This isn't for me." Church forced that marriage to stop. Um, Katie Holmes, all, all of his marriages since then and his relationships since then have been arranged by the Church of Scientology. They'll find some hot actress that's a Scientologist and they'll set him up. Um, so it really, like, it, it's allowed, it, it, Scientology doesn't allow him to live his life. I mean, they take care of him in opulence. They pay for all his fucking cars and jets and shit and refurbish his house. And, but when it comes down to it, he's not allowed to do anything outside of the church. Here we go. Let's take a little look. Criminon, we can rehabilitate criminals. Way to happiness, we can bring peace uh, and unite cultures. Uh, that once you know these tools and you know that they work, it's it's not good enough that, that I'm just doing okay. Traveling the world and meeting the people that I that I've met, you know, talking with these leaders in the various fields. They want help, and they are depending on people who know and who can be effective and do it. And that's us. That is our responsibility to do that. It is the time now. Speaking now of is the time. It's the responsibility of Scientologists okay. to do that. Yes. It Only is. A Being a Scientologist, people are turning to you, so you better know it. You better know it. I hope they're not and turning to Scientology for answers. You know. Go oh, and they're, learn. they're laying on this Mission Impossible fucking you know music so oh. fucking thick. Like he's famous. Remember Mission Impossible? That's that's what that's what the Remember big Mission movie. Impossible. He was in that. He was in these movies. This he big was in franchise. That right now. This this uh it was actually recorded for the church when they presented Tom with uh, the Freedom Medal of Valor, which they invented for Tom Cruise. It's the highest honor that Scientology can bestow upon a person. I'm hearing some people say it was just a rumor that he left. So I don't know. There, there's yeah. something going on there. <laughs> But don't pretend you know it, and or for you know whatever. It's not just not just me. It's you. It's it everyone else. Something. One day, it'll be like that. You know what I'm saying? Maybe one no, day it will be. That. Wow, 
ESPs. Like, they'll just read about those in the history books, you know? ESPs. <laughs> so that's more Scientology lingo there for suppressive person. So if you are a critic of the church that's, um, you know, has enough notoriety, you will be declared an SP. That's a person that has malicious intent towards the church. So we're all SPs yeah. right now. Yeah, we're all SPs. Cool. And um, that, you're not allowed to associate with SPs in the church. Damn. Go through that so I could never hang out with Tom Cruise now. Nope. Nope. He, wouldn't, he won't even talk to you. Gay. It literally, it's, it's not prick. how to run from an SP. It's PTSSP, how to shatter suppression, confront shatter suppression. You apply it, it's like, boom. Because they don't come up to me and do that. Uh, they won't do it to me. Not to my face, you know, or anywhere in my vicinity where they feel they can be confronted, you know. So what he's talking about there is PTSSP, potential trouble, trouble source, uh, uh, suppressive person. So, like, Scientology has this always be on the offensive. That's, that's basically their thing. Um, L. Ron Hubbard codified it when he was on uh, his flagship, the Apollo, in the 70s. He called it fair game. It means that... Anybody that that does anything against the church says anything wrong or does anything to harm the church or tries to harm the church is Fair game. That means you can do anything you want to destroy them to defraud them to remove them from you know, whatever all, all the way up until killing them and uh, They still do this in the church you'll, you'll be declared fair game and what it is is like you immediately attack so if somebody comes up to you and says you know, what about Scientology's abuses of this? You know, you immediately find something about that person. So if they're with a news outlet, you know what news outlet they're with. You talk about how their news outlet is unfair to Scientology, how they're religious bigots, how that question is a bigoted question. Why aren't you asking Christians this question? You're always on the attack. Never, ever defensive. Cool. So kind of like Trump. Yep. That's neat. Um, all right. Well, that's, a, I think it's probably enough for Tom. Good old there Tom. There is a, a great quote from that interview and uh i was trying to fucking stumble across that one where uh tom basically says you know if you're driving past the scene of an, a car accident as a scientologist you want to get out and help because you're the only one who can yeah you know yeah you just know you're the only one who can really help not the paramedics not the police and the fire department all that bullshit hell no they're worthless as a Scientologist, you are the only motherfucker who can really help. And this is how they help. So, so when there's disasters and shit, Scientology will set up a little tent offering what's called touch assists. And what that is, is you lay down on a massage table and a Scientologist puts his hands on you and just kind of touches your body in various areas. And that's supposed to help Kinky. you out. So, you know, during a hurricane, it's so good to know. Basically, he just, his, his, his instinct is to go molest car crash victims. Yeah. Is what you're telling me. Yeah. Put them on a table and put your hands on them, you know. That's what yeah. people are looking for when they don't have water or shelter after a hurricane. Yeah, you know, they have those wildfires. They just go out there in L.A. and be, or California and be like, hey, you know what, guys? It's not a big deal. All you have to do is just be touched by a Scientologist. Just, be, just get fucking felt up by Tom Cruise and you'll be okay. It's fantastic. All right. Uh, we have one more video here. This one's called Tall Tale. I don't know what it is. All right. Let's just take a quick little gander at it. I was with a bunch of criminals one time uh, as a, <laughs> a ranger well, I all the time up in the uh, Montana when I was a dude. kid. When the fuck did it? So he was in, he was a fucking great war hero. He's a prolific writer. And at some point, I guess he was a fucking ranger. Yeah, Montana ranger. Um, yeah, super war hero, nuclear physicist, inventor of many different technologies that are widely used by yeah. the military today. Inventor of the fucking Air Force, man. Yeah, all right. Uh, rangers have to take over crews of tramps and so forth sometimes in order to fight forest fires. You suddenly find yourself with a numerous fellows who have recently left Joliet without being properly uh, discharged. What is this corny fucking music? Now, oh, God. these criminals uh -huh. and what do bums they do? Uh, did a pretty good job fighting fire. Criminals can't work. That's mainly what's wrong with them. And you have to work real hard with That's criminals. That's mainly what's wrong with them? All. Yeah, they just don't and, uh, I, I not guess, the criminality. I guess, I guess he'd be a good one to one diagnose what's uh, wrong with criminals. Got burned off his feet, so I loaned him a he pair of him. boots that I had, an extra pair of boots. Extra power boots. I got him extra power boots. He was on another crew nice by the time I left the area, and I went back to Helena 
And when I got back to Helena, I said to myself, well, I'll never see those boots again. This fellow stole a car and drove 200 miles. To bring me my boots. And he returned me my boots. Bullshit. They have strange no. ways <laughs> way. of transacting. So wait a one, one, you weren't there fighting any fires. Uh, two, you never would have given him a pair of fucking boots. I mean, but... <laughs> So basically, we're, we're supposed to believe that this guy that he lent these boots to was honest enough to drive 200 miles to return his boots to him, but dishonest enough to steal someone else's car to do it. Yes. Yep. Okay. Also, how the fuck did he know where he lived? I don't know. Maybe he told him. Everybody know where L. Ron Hubbard lived in Montana, the greatest ranger of Montana history. Excuse me, do you know that do you, is it, do you know that extraordinary bastard L. Ron Hubbard lives? Everyone knows where well, they can th find old L. Ron. That's why these lies are so clumsy, like Paul said. I mean, the system and the people he surrounded himself with weren't allowed to question anything he was, he was saying. So it's like, whatever he says is the gospel truth. You just have to go, okay, yep, that happened. This fella here drove 200 miles in a stolen car. What to return me my boots? Ha ha ha, wonderful! It's hard to find a lot of his, his but he didn't even stick to stuff that could have happened. Like once once the alien shit got out and he started doing these higher level congresses with people that knew about the alien shit, he would talk about like because a big thing in Scientology is going exterior. They believe that you can go outside your body and float around and visit things. And oh Elrond would God. talk about how he visited Venus, and he was like, you know, they say Venus is uninhabitable, but uh, I think that that's wrong because I was almost hit by a freight train while exploring the uh, the surface of Venus the other day in exterior form. So he claimed that there was some fucking colony of human beings on fucking Venus. Oh, neat. All right, I want to show you guys uh, some pictures here. Sweet. This is, uh, that's not the right one. Here we go. This is the one I, I put, I think this was the one I used at the beginning yeah. of this. Uh, this is a young L. Ron Hubbard. This is uh, circa 1930. He was born, I don't remember the year. Uh, he's 19 here. Yeah, so this is him as a very young man. Yeah, so okay. and look pretty dapper. I'm not you know, not a bad looking dude, right? Eh. Hard to hard to look at this dude and see that he's going to turn into the big blubbering whale. Well, yeah, monster. not so, not a great picture, but you know maybe he's, he's all right looking. Here's he's a normal looking here's guy. like sort of towards the middle late part of his life. Yeah, he's mm -hmm. way 40, down way downhill. Fifties probably. Yeah, he looks like he's probably in his early to late 50s. But here. he's rocking that ascot and sweater vest like nobody in the history of... Uh, like, look at that, dude. Butterfly collar. Yeah, he, he looks like an older version of Fred from Scooby-Doo. <laughs> yeah, 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 dude. This Butterfly one, collar, this blue Fred, sweater vest, yeah, Fred, beautiful ascot. Let me just see if Fred I can get a himself go a little here. bit in his old age. <laughs> he does kind of look like him. Holy shit, and what a ginger mane on that hair. Nice uh nice scenery though, nice background. Let oh, me yeah. just uh let me just give you a fucking com let's just take a little comparison here. Uh here we go. That's uh more of let's see. Let's back with I'm, they keep giving me these fucking ones from these new shitty versions. Yeah, no ascot in those. All right. Where's the f wow, where's a good fucking picture of Fred, dude? Okay, there we go. There's a classic fucking Fred right there. Oh yeah. Hold on, let me just uh, let me just get the fucking uh, image it's by itself. Yeah, it looked pretty close. There we go. Yep. Damn. Look at him. If fucking Fred was a ginger, dude, that's him. I mean, this is, this is pretty goddamn close, dude. He's got the ascot going on. He's got a pretty fucking similar color scheme going on. He's yep. got the blondish hair. Yep. You know, this is either Fred's dad or Fred the later years, dude. Yeah, he's looking pretty fucking gentlemanly here in this picture. <laughs> so Fred starts a fucking crazy religious cult. Maybe I should bring back the ascot, dude. I'm going to start wearing ascots. I'm going to take a note out of Hubbard's book. Dude, dude, I will order you an ascot right fucking now. All right, do it. You I'll wear an ascot. You want an ascot? Yep, I want an ascot, dude. All right. it's, it's time for the ascot to an fucking ascot. come back. He looks too good, dude. Like, he looks way too you good think, in the ascot. You think you can pull off the ascot, Paul? Oh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know, Paul. I don't, I'm not I sure. don't know if you have the right kind of shirts to pull off an ascot. Yeah, you don't well, really... Mm. I mean, that may be true. <laughs> I don't have a whole lot of collared shirts. What color ascot do you want, dude? Some flamboyant, man. It's got to be nice and colorful. Like dude. a get, purple ascot? Yeah, dude, get Paul a purple one, dude. Yeah, like some, yeah, purple or royal blue or some shit. You know what I mean? Like, something that really pops. Paul right. wears a lot of blacks. I, I would get him, like, a purple, dude. Yeah. 
I've got these. I've got these. You know, really nice blue eyes. Something that'll bring out my blue eyes, TJ. My, my baby blues. My TJ. baby blues should be complimented by this ascot, and All it's right. got to be big enough to where my beard doesn't hide the ascot too. Because there's no point in wearing an ascot if your beard is. He just wants hanging. a flamboyant ass fucking ascot. It's got to be crazy good, dude. Yeah, maybe a lime green ascot, TJ. <laughs> I don't know. Here's a. Uh... I'm finding some ascots here. Sweet. Some ascots. We're gonna have to. Uh, we're gonna have to look into this later, though. Yeah, we'll I'll have to look into how to, to tie way. an ascot. I don't know how to do that. You know what I mean? You're gonna learn, Paul. Yeah, gonna You're have gonna to learn how to do it. I'm bringing it back. You're gonna wear an ascot with your hoodie. It's I'm tired of this schlubby stoner look I've got going on, man. I'm going for that Hubbard. I'm gonna get some sweater vests, some butterfly collared shirts, and some ascots. I'm gonna start rocking it, dude. I'm, I need a new look. You're gonna go with, and that's my look. look. That's right my there. look right there. We're gonna go to. The, we're gonna take Paul to the fucking Pacific Ocean. Take this nice majestic picture. Yeah, I might do like darker colors on my body and a, and a more vibrant ascot. He's kind of got the inverse. You All know right, what I mean? So once again, this is Hubbard Young. Yep. Here he is, not middle aged, but a little <laughs> above middle age. Yeah. And uh, here's him towards the end of his life. It's actually the last photo ever taken of Hubbard. So this is the very. This oh, is the Jesus. last known photo here. Now, now he looks like what is it like Wormtail for oh, Harry Potter, Hubbard. dude? God, he looks like. He looks uh, like by oh, the way, your girlfriend is protesting your new look in the chat, Paul. Well, I mean, she's gonna have to get used to it. Yeah, Paul's gonna wear an ascot. He's beautiful as he is. She's gonna have to love me for who I am, and the person that I am as of tonight is a dude that wears ascots. So. Ascots and sweater vests. I guess this will be the first test of our relationship. Let's see if she really loves me. Yeah, let's see how fucking committed she really is. So he's definitely premise. he's definitely got even fatter than he was before. Uh, his, ha his hair is unkempt. Yeah. He's, he's really going bald at this point. One of the uh, dudes that uh, put together his personal papers described him at this point in his life. Because at this point in his life, he was living in a trailer on a little piece of ranch land near Pasadena, California. And he was hiding from the IRS. Nobody knew he was living there. And he was basically so paranoid at this point that he wouldn't talk to anybody except for his most, like, his closest confidants. And uh, one guy who hadn't seen him for a long time went to visit him to put his papers in order and shit. And he described him as, like, sweaty and way fatter. Uh, his hair was unkempt. His nails had grown out and yellowed to an extraordinary length. And he was surrounded by prescription pills. Which is interesting because part of Scientology's tenets is you don't take medicine for shit. Especially not psychological medicines. And he was surrounded by all kinds of Vistaril and, you know, early psychological drugs and shit. So at the end of his life, he really kind of walked back a lot of his principles and uh, apparently was having a really hard time. He would kind of descended into this personal paranoia that... Kind of his, his descent into... Well, I mean... Obviously, he knew he was full of shit. I mean, to some degree. I mean, maybe even he didn't recognize how much, but at the end of life, when he knew his death was imminent, of course, he was starting to probably be a little more honest, at least internally. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people posit that, you know, that paranoia was born out of all those lies that he was told. And, and that, plus the fact that the IRS was pursuing him doggedly everywhere he went, you know, he just didn't trust anybody, didn't trust anything. He was afraid that the whole fucking house of cards was going to come crashing down at any moment, started being really vicious with people in his inner circle, firing them and sending them to the hole and the RPF for shit. I mean, it, he kind of went nuts in his older years. Uh, we're experiencing some pretty serious lag here on uh, the stream. Whoops. Um, I think we've probably explored this topic pretty well today. I think so. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just say we should end this because, uh, unfortunately, the lag issue is getting pretty severe to the point where I don't think the people watching live are even able to, to really enjoy it. All right. Too so, bad, but thanks for watching, guys. Thank you we guys for watching. It. If you have heard of this, uh, I don't know if a no. Maybe, we, maybe we're getting a DD, DDoS from the Church of Scientology Maybe. Or I mean, I wouldn't be surprised, honestly. I wouldn't be either. Um, anyway, thank you guys for checking it out. I hope you learned something new today about uh, probably one of the greatest hucksters of all time. Maybe if Trump wasn't president, he would be considered yeah. the greatest huckster of all <laughs> yeah. time. Yeah. But uh, you, you're, it's going to be a long time before anyone tops Trump in the huckster department, I think. Uh, not many scammers scam their way into the presidency. I mean, it, I don't know, dude. The president. The presidency is one thing. Starting your own religion is a fucking other thing. If Trump had a religion, I guess he kind of does. Yeah, he really does a little to bit. a degree. I mean, he, they call him the God Emperor and shit. Mm. I mean, they're being somewhat Neil before sarcastic, Trump. but you know. Well, good night, everybody. Good night and good See luck. Friday. Sorry for the lag. Hopefully, the uh, version that goes up on YouTube yep. will be less laggy. See everyone on Monday. Peace. Peace.